Good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to this uh, final conference for Assessat Learning, and in particular to the second webinar of this Assessat Learning conference entitled Bringing Different Voices Together and Learning from Them. This webinar is the second in the series of three webinars, which all together make up the Assessat Learning final conference. We had a first webinar last Monday about the Assessat Learning story and what is digital formative assessment and what we've learned about it in Assessat Learning. Today, we are uh, together for this second webinar about bringing different voices together and learning from them. We have a third webinar coming on Friday entitled, What do education actors need to get started on digital formative assessment? And we will look then at the different tools and processes to implement digital formative assessment in schools. So I warmly encourage you to join us also on Friday, the 10th of February at 3 p.m. Central European time. I also encourage you to watch the recording of the first webinar. And if you participated to the, to the first webinar, you received the link, but you also received the link with the reminder for today's webinar. So I warmly encourage you to also watch the recording to get better understanding of the Assessat Learning Policy Experimentation. For those of you who participated in the first webinar and are here with us again today, please also take just five minutes to respond to a short survey about how the webinar went. Thank you. We have a first question to you, to uh, uh, our, our audience. Uh, there are tens of you watching us right now. We'd like to know a little bit more about you uh, so that when the question and answer session comes, we can know you a little bit better. So we'd like to know what type of stakeholder uh, you are. So you can see here, the question, and if you go to www.menti.com and enter the code which you see on the screen, then you can respond to the question and let us know what type of stakeholder you are. What are we going to do today? We're going to first look in detail in the dialogue lab process, this process of bringing different stakeholders together who have sometimes different views, sometimes even conflicting views about the issue of digital formative assessment. And we'll look at that process in detail and what can come out of it. We'll also look at um, the social aspects of formative assessment, digital assessment, and digital formative assessment, and the social aspects of these on the student. We'll look at the digital divide. We'll look at equity and fairness, the whole school approach, and the role of the teacher. And we'll listen to what stakeholders discussed at the different dialogue labs, including students. What do they have to say about these issues? With us today, we have Professor Kay Livingston from the University of Glasgow, Professor Janet Elwood, from Queen's University, Belfast. We also have Ignacio Casado Alda, the Spanish Ministry of Education and Vocational Training, and Hermione Nena Caragiani from the Computer Technology Institute and Press Diophantus in Greece. We also have two colleagues from European Schoolnet who will be acting as moderators interacting with you uh, the audience, the participants. We have Antoine Selim Bilgin and Milena Harvat. So if you have a question, don't hesitate. Please share your comments, your question in the chat. You can see the chat functionality on the right hand side of your, of your screen. So please use it, share your thoughts, your comments, ask questions, and we'll be relaying them to the speakers and answering them in the chat as well. Before we go into the dialogue lab process and the social impact that digital formative assessment has on students, 
a quick reminder about what Asset Learning is, in a nutshell. Asset Learning is a policy experimentation that ran from 2019 to 2023, which aims at testing the impact of a systemic toolkit on the adoption of digital formative assessment practices in schools, but also discussing the social impact of digital formative assessment on students. Now for this, in assessment learning, we had two work strands in parallel. We first had, for the quantitative evaluation, a randomized controlled trial with more than 200 schools in five countries, nearly and over 2,500 students. To understand the results of the randomized controlled trial, I again encourage you to watch the recording of the first webinar we had on Monday. We also had, in parallel to this, a more qualitative evaluation with, as I, as I mentioned, a series of dialogue labs, bringing together stakeholders with different perspectives on digital formative assessment. And that's what we're going to hear about today. So without any further delay, I would like to welcome Professor Kay Livingston from the University of Glasgow and Janet Elwood from Queen's University, Belfast. Hello, Kay. Hello, Janet. Thank you, Alex, and thank you for your welcome. And may I add my welcome to all the participants of the webinar. Together with my colleague, Jeanette Elwood, um, we are going to share with you some more details about the Dialogue Lab for those who are joining uh, for the second time and for those who are coming along for the first time to webinar number two. Um, just to explain a bit more, we were responsible for the qualitative element of the Assess at Learning Policy Experimentation. And this is our opportunity to really take time to give you more details about the Dialogue Lab approach and also about the findings that we had in relation to all of the different voices that were involved in participating in the Dialogue Labs giving a, a better understanding of the findings that we got and if I could ask for my presentation to be uploaded thank you very much um, we'll move on to start the presentation so first of all to tell you a bit more about what the dialogue lab approach was all about it was an opportunity to bring together a range of different stakeholders <laughs> who had responsibility for or direct experience of formative assessment or digital formative assessment in schools. And each dialogue lab lasted for three hours. Our intention originally was for a whole day event, and I'll explain why that was the case. But as we were operating within the period of the COVID-19 restrictions, it meant that all of our dialogue labs had to take place online and they were then uh, reduced to three hours. But the focus really was about bringing together different stakeholders, different perspectives, being able to share their ideas and interact with one another and engage in dialogue. And in order to do that, the dialogue lab had to be set up for a period of time that really allowed that sense of getting to know one another and spending time in interaction with one another. So it wasn't a one hour meeting, it was giving them a sustainable amount of time to enable that dialogue to occur. How did it contribute to the policy experimentation? It had an opportunity to understand assessment, digital assessment and digital formative assessment from the different perspectives of the stakeholders. It also allowed us to understand the different experiences of those who were involved in terms of their opinions and their ideas about digital assessment, formative assessment and digital formative assessment, which meant that we could really bring these authentic voices, those that were directly involved to the policy experimentation. 
The dialogue labs were of two types. We had country dialogue labs. We had five European countries who were engaged in setting up the dialogue labs. Each dialogue lab could have up to 36 stakeholders invited. And as I've said, those had responsibility for or actually were experiencing digital assessment or digital formative assessment in schools. The stakeholders that were invited included, for example, across the countries, policymakers, educational agency officials, initial teacher education and continuous professional development and educators, teachers, school leaders, educational experts, consultants, researchers, parents and school inspectors. Each country had um, certain differences in the titles that were associated with those stakeholders, but that gives you a sense of the different voices that we had. Country dialogue labs were um, had already um, been trialed in a previous policy experimentation that uh, European School Net had coordinated the Teach Up project. But what was unique about Assess at Learning? was that the country dialogue labs also included in the six possible stakeholders up to 10 school students and we also had the opportunity for student dialogue labs and there was two of those run in each of the five european countries there could be up to five up to 25 school students participating and they were aged between the age of 14 and 17 years and I'll explain the reason for that uh, in the next slides. Each student dialogue lab was designed to uh, collect the authentic voices of students bringing that unique element of hearing from them about their opinions and views about digital assessment and digital formative assessment and it was also an opportunity to build capacity with the students to be able to participate and engage in bringing their voice to the country dialogue labs and a selection of the students who were participating in the student dialogue labs were able then to participate in each of the country dialogue labs. The dialogue labs were purposefully set up as a series so that there was a connection between each of the dialogue labs. They didn't stand alone. The idea was that we were building understanding from dialogue lab to dialogue lab. And we were also building a community of stakeholders that really had a commitment not only to the policy experimentation in terms of developing understanding of digital formative assessment and digital assessment more generally, but also the commitment to building a group of stakeholders who had different perspectives on a particular education topic. The first dialogue lab that was held was a student dialogue lab in 2021. And the reason for that was to bring the students together to give them a sense of building capacity in how they engage in dialogue, but also so they could prepare to be able to share their views, to share their perspectives in the country dialogue lab and a selection of them moved into the first country dialogue lab that was held. 2021 was the first one, and it then led into the second one at the beginning, in the beginning section of 2022, and then in 2022, the third dialogue lab towards the end, after the randomized control trials that Alex explained in his introduction. And again, a selection of the students were involved in each of these dialogue labs. And then they came back together again in the second student dialogue lab. The main point about the participants was the intention was that they would be the same participants all the way through the process. So the students who had begun in the first student dialogue lab, the reason why we were asking for them to be 14 years of age at the beginning was as they were moving through each of the dialogue labs and coming back together in the second student dialogue lab, we wanted to be hearing as far as possible from the same students 
not only in terms of how they developed their understanding of digital formative assessment, but also how they had experienced the opportunity to have a voice and to be able to share their opinions about what they were experiencing. One of the other key elements about the Dialogue Lab approach was that there was feedback after each of the Dialogue Labs. And again, this was twofold in the one sense to demonstrate that we were building understanding through the process, but also to make sure that all of the stakeholders understood that what they were saying, the opinions that they were offering were being heard were being recorded and were contributing to the policy experimentation. So some of the feedback that came from the first student dialogue lab could contribute to what happened in the, the first CDL. All of the countries reported back after that first CDL, they were analysed and they were then brought forward into offering feedback at the start of the second CDL. And so each of the participants could feel that they were part of a European project. They could hear anonymized feedback, what the other countries had said, and they were able to feel that they were contributing to the overall development of the policy experimentation. You'll see on this slide just some of the statistics in terms of the numbers who were involved. I won't go into this in too much detail, as I know that you will get these slides but it gives you a sense of the student dialogue labs and the numbers from the, the total of the five countries. And again, you'll see the numbers there for the total numbers for the um, country dialogue labs. We had both uh, boys and girls participating in the student dialogue lab. You can see the balance there. And also you will see the contribution of the students in the country dialogue labs in terms of the numbers of students that were there. Each of the dialogue labs were supported by detailed guidelines. This allowed each of the countries to ensure that there was consistency in their approach. It was research, so we were gathering data, and my colleague will say a bit more about that in a minute. But we wanted the approach to be as similar as possible. So the detailed guidelines set out how they would go about uh, implementing the dialogue labs and also explained quite clearly about how the selection of the participants and how they should engage with them in setting up the dialogue lab. The key aspect of a dialogue lab is active participation of the stakeholders. It's about dialogue. So we didn't want the participants to be sitting listening as you are at the moment. The, the focus and the emphasis in the guidelines was ensuring that the stakeholders could engage in and interact with one another as soon as possible and as much as possible in the dialogue labs. So fewer and short presentations to structure what was going on in terms of the dialogue, but really making sure the emphasis was on the interaction between different stakeholders with different experiences coming from very different contexts and also being able to share those with one another. The other key point of emphasis in the guidelines was ensuring that they were able to listen to different views and different perspectives. They had facilitators whose role was to ensure that all of the stakeholders had an opportunity to be able to offer their voice and to make sure that they were focused on the focus questions that had been set up and also in terms of developing that sense of community throughout the dialogue. Another key aspect of the dialogue lab approach is that it's structured and facilitated dialogue. So the dialogue was structured by a focus question and in this case the policy experimentation was in relation to digital assessment and digital formative assessment, it meant that each of the focus questions was on assessment and was ensuring that each time we had a country dialogue lab, the focus was changing according to the development and the feedback that we were getting um, throughout the whole process. 
the standard agenda set out how the whole dialogue lab would be structured. It provided the focus questions and it followed a very similar pattern. There was usually three or at the most four sessions in total and it started off with a very short presentation on what the topic of the focus question was. Then the stakeholders broke into small groups so that they could engage around five or six people was the intention, depending on the overall number that was there. They then had time to really engage in with one another and also to, to focus in on their different perspectives and experiences around the focus question. And then they had to identify main points that they wanted to feedback and share in a plenary session so they were able to hear how the other groups uh, were interacting and also the comments that they were feeding back. Another key aspect of the Dialogue Lab approach was that in each session, the groups changed so that you had an opportunity to engage with as many of the stakeholders as possible, build that sense of community with everyone and to be able to have an opportunity to hear as many different perspectives as possible. As I said, it was a research project and so the ethical guidelines were clearly set out for all of the countries to follow and it, it focused on making clear that it was voluntary consent for the participants. We wanted the group to say as similar as possible throughout the whole process. It was the same participants that we were inviting, but it was voluntary for them in terms of their consent. It was also for each country made clear about how the data would be gathered, how it would be stored and how it would be used. Each country then had a reporting template that they followed, which meant that we were able to collect the voices. What was said in terms of the dialogue was recorded, it was transcribed and it was translated into English. And it was then fed back to us, Jeanette and myself. We were then able to analyze it and offer that anonymous feedback for the following uh, dialogue lab to take place. So in essence, the dialogue was our data. And when you look across the two student dialogue labs and the three country dialogue labs, we had 75 hours of data. And Jeanette will take you through the nature of that data. Thank you, Kay. I think we just wanted to share with you the fact that ultimately um, we were dealing with text data um, but it came as Kay said it came very quickly from the um, the dialogue labs and also um, from the reports so um, the text data was really from the main and summary reports by the facilitators so there was the main report from the, the dialogue labs, the summaries from each of the plenary sessions uh, from the SDLs and CDLs, summaries from breakout groups and summaries um, of views on the process. We, we asked the participants exactly what it was, um, what, they, um, what they were talking about. Um, and then the text data from the breakout groups, um, initially the way the, um, the dialogue labs were planned was that it was going to be um, on um, sort of post-it notes and um, sort of facilities that you might see common in a workshop type environment. But because we had to move online, we then asked for text to be put into chat facilities. We used other software such as Padlet posts and we use voting apps as well. And we heard, uh, sorry, we were able to record all of those and the translators in each of the five countries were able to translate that for us. So while we have some very, very rich text data, recognize that it's translated data, um, but we have been working very closely with our partners 
in the five countries. And if there was anything that we didn't quite understand, we were able to ask for um, clarification on that. Um, so from the text data and from the sort of the, the wealth of data that we got, what the process really was that Kay and I, um, we went away separately and then we read the reports. We looked at the text data and given our, given our um, emphasis on um, uh, what we knew about digital formative assessment, we started to thematically go through uh, those reports. Then we came together um, as researchers to discuss and actually, that's Ron Clark methodology, which is really about the critical reflective practice around looking at data and um, uh, and reflecting on that. We've also presented some of our ideas um, uh, at other events, and so we were able to get feedback again from that. So it's a re it's, it's sort of an iterative process of looking at data and trying to understand the messages um that we were uh that we were receiving both from the data and our own understanding um of that so i think we're going to move on to the the data and i i think um unfortunately both k and i can't hear <laughs> i can hear k but k unfortunately can't hear me um so i'm going to start with some of the um the data that as i said to you it's a iterative process so what happens is that Kay and i discussed the reports together we went away separately and then came back together and continuously talked about what we were seeing in the data and that was sort of um uh, a notion of if we if you like the themes and so these are some of the bigger themes that we felt that were coming out of the data that really had the impact um, for us. So one of the main social aspects that we find, and we wanted to try and share with you our understandings of what we um, understand as social. And we're taking the position that what we're really concerned with is the social lives of students in schools, the interaction of students with teachers, the way in which they experience school and the way in which um, they then experience their formative and summative assessment in relation to their teachers and to, and to peers and themselves. So it's the lived experience of assessment for young people in schools. And this is what they told us when we started to talk to them about um, the social aspects of um, the data. They were very clear. And this, again, is coming out of the pandemic experience for them, that there, did, there was a digital poverty, sort of digital divide. Now, this is not new to maybe stories for other for people who are listening to us today, because lots of COVID studies have brought about the notion of the digital divide. But I, I, we thought it was very important that also our data sings to that same tune um, as well. And they were very clear, students, that there were digital differences in the devices that were available, software and broadband, problems with reliability of the hardware and the software, and just the challenges of dealing in a digital landscape internet crashing, passwords and access, and not unlike us dealing today, uh, being on this software platform. They were very clear that investment was needed in schools for staff and students to sort of navigate the technical infrastructure. Um, and then we're very concerned about when those conditions were lacking and those resources were lacking. Um, and of course, that was not ideal. So, um, if we could move on to the, the next slide. These are just some um, quotes from students. So that's going to be the pattern. We'll show you some of the, the data and then we'll show you some quotes. So the, 
it's very clear there that um, not all students and teachers had the wherewithal maybe about how some of the software was used. That was a sort of a divide that came up, um, the technology to carry out the activities. And then it's really maybe a school responsibility to have the equipment because not all children can access equipment from home and not all children have the wherewithal to have smartphones or laptops or even internet connection. So there's a responsibility for the school uh, that they should have that equipment if digital formative assessment or digital assessment is going to be the way forward. So the next um, slide, we started to see some issues around equity and fairness and students are very attuned I think to their um, their own sense of equity and fairness, however they understand that, um, and also of their peers. And this was sort of linked with this notion um, of the very powerful narrative of summative assessment. And a lot of you won't be surprised by that, that actually, even though we've had years of thinking about different ways of assessing at both the school and system level, that the, the powerful narrative of summative assessment still, still holds true. So students were very aware about equity and fairness. They um, were not all were keen about online exams, uh, if that's what they were experiencing, because there was a sense that the teacher can't um, can't check if students are cheating and this idea of cheating or um, being able to game the system uh, came up um, uh, later and there was a sense of the equity and fairness is that you both need to sorry you need to have both you need formative and summative to consider the best scenario uh, for students because some students are better at presenting themselves uh, within a summative framework or within a formative framework. And then there was a sense that students were not quite used to or didn't quite like the, the, the tests and exams. And again, it might be very stressful for them because uh, there's limited experience of that. And they were sort of thrown into that. I think when we were doing the first SDL, they were thrown into this notion of doing tests at a distance and not always quite sure whether things were, were being um, recorded properly. So in terms of the narrative of sum summative assessment, um, still within across the five countries, uh, students are mostly evaluated through using exams. And it was sort of seen as a way of, um, they sort of understood that this was something that they would have to do, or this was how they would have to be assessed but they still find it quite stressful. And again, it, that was that call for the, the grades not showing everything that they could do and they would like an opportunity to do that. And actually digital formative assessment or formative assessment generally would allow them to do that. Um, so there was a sense that even though they liked the ways in which formative assessment could help them work, there was a dissonance between the way in which they um, would like to be assessed and how they were being assessed. So if we move on to the, the next slide, uh, and that will just show you some, some quotes from, from students about this. Very philosophical in some way that teachers are put is on the, the right path in life with assessment. So assessment is necessary. And that was a very clear message too, which is often contradictory, I think, maybe to the, maybe, uh, the idea that's out there that students don't like assessment. They realize it's necessary. They like it for motivation. They realize that they need to be evaluated and they want to be, they think they just want it done fairly. Uh, and also um, that everybody has a chance to show themselves to good effect. So that assessment is about seeing progress, it's about improving, and also um, even formative assessment is as stressful as graded assessment. And I think that that's a, another key message for us uh, is that, you know, sometimes formative assessment is seen as 
to be ben is the benign type of assessment and actually summative assessment is the stressful overburdensome type of assessment but it's assessment in general that gets students quite quite stressed and so it's how we deal with that collectively I think is a way to improve that. So the next slide shows um, something that we were really very interested to see. And this was sort of a clear call from schools to have, and a clear call, sorry, from students that schools would have whole school protocols. They saw digital assessment and digital formative assessment as a, a new practice, as a new way of operating in schools. And they were quite keen that maybe some rules <laughs> or regulations might be put down to either protect them or to understand how things should work so that everybody would be on the same uh, on the same page. They were keen that there would be some protocols where teachers um, applied things in the same way and that spoke to their experience of the the way in which they they interact with different teachers across the school day asking them to do different things using different software platforms or the same software platforms but in different ways so they just wanted some sense of um similar pra practice another thing was about capacity building and we've heard about that already but one students would sort of say, you can't assume that everybody knows how to use all the software and all the apps in the same way. Not everybody is as proficient as everybody else. Something that came up later uh, in the data was something about the use of young people's data by schools and assessment data is part of that. And maybe colleagues who were at the eminent conference in uh, December in Dublin, when we were talking a lot about this aspect, about how the move to digital sort of impacts on the, the data and the use of data and who owns that data uh, for students. So there was a sense that um, students got start to get concerned that maybe schools were bypassing them with all the technology was that was out there they could actually speak to parents before they spoke to students about feedback and students seemed to think that that was problematic they wanted the feedback first rather than their parents getting it um and there was really a sort of a call for as that says unification of the use of tools um, and a reassessment of all the processes that were that would be that are going on. Um, and it's really important they were saying that teachers have the tools under control and that they work with them in a in a clear and consistent manner. So if we move on to the the next slide, and again, so there's just some of the the direct uh, quotes from the translated text. Um, again, this this you know, concern that families with fewer resources aren't able to keep up with their peers at home. Um, occasionally, we might see this grey area of regarding data gathering and information is uh, not necessarily um, in schools. And then just this notion of who 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 is the relationship with with assessment data and reporting back and feeding back. Uh, and I quite like that sort of this notion of the digital uh, stress. And that's really about sort of students thinking, I don't really want, I want my parents to be part of my conversation, but I don't want them to have the data first. So I think now we're going to move on to some of the, the data that um, Kay is going to discuss and um, talk with you. Okay, it's time for you to have an opportunity to uh, have a say here. Uh, as I said in, in my introduction, that um, we really focused in the dialogue labs on dialogue. So it seems a bit strange to be asking you to sit passively for, for so long, which is the complete opposite of how the dialogue lab approach runs. So first of all, um, to get you uh, sharing your thoughts in your view, what are some of the practical ways that we could work with students to enable greater student involvement in de developing DFA policies in schools? 
So if you could put in uh, at least one idea into the www.menti.com and to do that, you need to enter the code that's running along the bottom of the screen, 88600681, and we'll give you a minute or two to do that. Well, thank you to all of you who have uploaded some ideas. And when we get to the end of our presentation, we'll pause again and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to be able to, to see what you have responded. So just to, to move on to some of the other findings that we had uh, in listening to the various voices of our stakeholders. Um, can you move the slides on, please? Oh, that's it. So the next aspect that we had emerging findings from our various stakeholders was on the social aspects of formative di assessment, digital assessment, and digital formative assessment in relation to different understandings. And what we found was that both students and the st other stakeholders had different understandings. And that wasn't in any particular country. It was across countries. So there was differences within the countries as well as across countries. And the difference was for some the difference between what formative assessment meant and digital formative assessment wasn't always clear to the students. The students did recognize that within the subjects, what they were experiencing was differences, differences in how the teachers engaged with them, differences in how they used them, difference in some of the digital tools. In some cases, the same digital tool was used in different subjects. In some subjects, it was something different that was offered. And in some subjects, the digital tools were used often and others, they were hardly used at all. So not only were they experiencing different understandings of digital formative assessment and digital assessment in general, they were also having different understandings of what formative assessment meant. For some of them, it was uh, clear to them that it was about giving feedback in some way about how they were progressing in their learning. And for them, in terms of a social impact of that, it was the importance of interaction. And in most cases, interaction with their teacher and how they, they valued that possibility. And some of the particular quotes that we had for some of the students, what they were saying is, well, I'm not sure what digital formative assessment is. It isn't something that's necessarily been discussed or made clear about how it was being approached. While for other students, they were very clear in offering what their thoughts and their understandings of digital formative assessment was all about. And for them, the sense of assessment is being used as a way to collect information about what knowledge is being acquired and the sense of being in terms of the pro process of learning and that digital assessment uses technology in the process and that was moving the formative assessment into that digital domain. And again, other students really emphasizing the importance of feedback and how the sense of the immediacy of the feedback was important to them and it allowed them, it built their awareness of what their mistakes were and also how they might correct them um, straight away. So the sense of the interaction with their teacher and the social impact of that, but also the cognitive impact in the, the dual aspect of being able to hear directly from their teacher with some immediacy, but at the same time being able to think about how they might improve their learning. In terms of how that process became important, there was recognition that for some of them, they were saying that the use of the digital tool brought them closer to their teacher in terms of what they felt was breaking down barriers, the one-to-one -one interaction. And often the one-to-one -one interaction that they raised was the importance of when it was in the digital domain it allowed them some sense of privacy in that there weren't peers in the classroom 
who were listening to that interaction between them and their teacher. And that was related to them not only becoming uh, more aware of, but that sense of saying that for some of them, they preferred to be assessed that way because not only did it give them a sense of their awareness of their own learning, but also they mentioned for some digital formative assessment, they felt it was a more informal way of assessing. And it linked to the comment that I will make and, and my colleague Jeanette was making in relation to the reduction for some of them in stress when it moved into the digital domain for them. Again, you'll see in some of the quotes, uh, in particular, the sense of the removal of stress from their peers. In classrooms, it's sometimes hard to step up and present their thoughts, thinking about their, their own self-awareness, but also perhaps their status with their peers. It might feel stressful. And asking for help from a teacher in a classroom felt like a big leap for some of them. And digital assessment can lower that step to ask for help. So when they were in a, in a context of interaction directly with their teacher online through technical means, then it provided them the opportunity to be able to have that very direct conversation to enter into dialogue without feeling that anyone else was listening to them, nobody else was seeing them ask for help, and that sense of privacy uh, really helped the socio-emotional impact uh, for some of them. For others, there was a sense of there was too many apps and tools. And I think the previous comment shows that the interaction with the teacher was, was a really important aspect for some of them, and the tools were less important. And again, they were saying that they would like a better focus on how they should use these tools and why they were using these tools. And they wanted a, a better sense of assessment that suited them. For some of the students, it was very much about their preference and their enjoyment of formative assessment. For others, they were very clear that it was that balance between using both the digital formative assessment, but also the more traditional assessment processes as well. So there were some similarities in findings across the country, countries, but there were also within country and across country differences in what the students went, really focusing on uh, demonstrating to us the individuality of some of the, the feelings that the, the, the students were sharing. You'll see that in terms of the interaction and the feedback that the role of the teacher became very important and the sense that formative assessment and the value and the, the, the status that was attached to formative assessment for some of them again was different in the sense that some teachers emphasized the formative assessment approach and really valued that opportunity to have the interaction with their, their students but were concerned about the tools, the digital tools and to what extent they had any control over the kind of feedback that was being given to their students. There was also a variation in the teacher's digital assessment capacity. So for some of them that restricted what was possible and restricted their ability to perhaps interact in a way that they would have liked. For some, they were feeling more comfortable in interaction in the classroom and not necessarily in that digital space. Uh, for others, they were comfortable in that space and could perhaps use their capacity to uh, really enhance what they were doing. Whereas for others, it was a lack of the pedagogical awareness of how to use the tools to really extend the possibility to support the students in the development of their learning or to use the tools to an extent where they were perhaps offering something different to the students from what would have been available to them in the classroom. For some of the stakeholders, it was a very, very clear comment that they saw the device as a sub story. And what was important was what they did with the devices and how they used them. And that really depended a lot on uh, the teacher's own capacity, 
not only their digital capacity, but also their pedagogical capacity. And also, as we've said in the previous slides, the whole school protocol in terms of the role, not only of the teacher, but also in terms of the school leaders and the decisions that are made across the whole school. So again, just to give you some of the quotes that came from our stakeholders, for some of the students, there was a sense of a lack of variety in the tools that were being used. Uh, they were clear that there was a lack of certain skills within ICT and digital tools for their teachers. And one of the students helpfully made the comment that digital formative assessment should be clear in initial digital training and it should be offered to teachers so that they are able to implement them um, and make best use of the digital possibilities that, that are there. Another uh, student comment that came across in our emerging findings was actually for some students, it's also important that they have some digital training and also training in relation to digital for assessment. So not only were they recognising the importance of uh, developing the teacher skills, but also the sense that for some students that weren't necessarily comfortable in using either the digital tools or comfortable in understanding what digital formative assessment meant, then they also needed some development in this area, which links into some of the, the comments that we make. We pull together our findings. So first and foremost, one of the benefits that was identified across our findings was that the digital formative assessment helped some students to really see the process and to make the learning process much more visible for them, where they had a sense of self-awareness of developing their own ability to self-assess and to be able to understand where they were making mistakes, where their strengths were, and how they could develop. And again, that linking between the social impact of interaction with their teacher, but at the same time, the opportunity for cognitive development. Reducing student stress, uh, as you have heard, again, that sense of digital formative assessment for some of them being seen as a more informal way of assessment, but also making a contribution to helping them move forward in their learning because of the immediacy of the feedback versus summative um, assessment, which somehow puts it into the formal aspect, and also that not necessarily getting the immediacy of feedback, and in some cases, not direct feedback other than a grade in terms of how they might progress their learning, and how that then can reduce the stress of the experience, and also the digital means for some of them meant that it, they saw it as more relatable and that sense of not quite so serious. And by that, um, we took it in terms of the formality. One other interesting finding that we have is in terms of not only the social benefit, but also the environment, the sense of the importance of digital assessment, improving the interaction between student and teachers for some of the students and also giving them more enjoyment of using the digital devices and increasing their motivation to engage with them. And as I've said, the more immediacy of it was, was something that emerged uh, quite uh, strongly. The other interesting aspect was the environmental and the understanding that using the, in, the digital space then wasn't up using jotters or textbooks and paper wasn't wasted and it was easier and more interesting. However, that contrasted with other stakeholders, teachers saying there is an incongruence in as much that uh, in schools, often mobile phones are not used and yet these would be a digital tool that would be ready and available to the students. Some limitations then in terms of findings that the lack of understanding of what digital formative assessment means did uh, limit some of the possibilities of its use and a suggestion really that, that it needs to be clear and it needs to be discussed not only across the whole school, amongst teachers, 
but also amongst the students themselves. So they have a better understanding of what it means. And this was linked to some extent in terms of the lack of clarity of meaning of it then meant it was more difficult for them to understand how these digital tools were, be, were being used. And for some of them, a mistrust then of what was being done with the data, if it was in moving it from a, a something that they saw as informal into a formal space where that was leaving a trace in some way. And how was that trace of their development then being either used or recorded? And in relation to the greater student involvement to discuss about their assessment, you've heard that there was an awareness on the student's behalf about the digital divide and that for some students, it then meant if they had less digital competence or had less access to digital tools, it then meant that it would be affecting their ability to move forward in their learning as some of them were. And they were feeling that they were being asked to, to work on their, their own. Then for some of them in that digital space, it might feel more isolating than being with their peers in the classroom. So again, the variability in terms of the individual the characteristics of the students. And I'll pass so, back to my colleague just to bring to, to a close uh, the main points of our findings. Thanks, Kay. So what we have here is really the um, culmination of the themes and then trying to reflect out to the wider maybe literature or experience of assessment generally that we, we know about. And running through the data, we think are these sort of reflections. We've, we've called them reflections. Uh, we're not quite there yet to sort of say that they're conceptual about the data, but they're sort of um, they're sort of summary summary spaces, if you like, where we think um, the the sort of the results are showing us. So, if we even reflect back to formative assessment and the movement to move formative assessment into schools that started with Black and William, they talk very much of a change of mindset or culture. Um, and it's no different with digital assessment or digital formative assessment. Any large scale reform movement that's looking at different ways of assessing young people in schools and using that data then to evaluate them and or their learning is really needs a shift. And it's not so much a, um, a shift in... Um, I sort of what we do, it's actually a shift in how we see assessment benefiting young people and the use of it uh, within schools and within policy. So even as we know over time that the, the formative versus summative dichotomy um, is, is there in terms of what we might call ordinary assessment, it's there in terms of digital assessment and digital formative assessment. If you think about digital, digital exams and online exams versus the use of digital tools to have formative assessment practice. And we sort of say that actually um, uh, that what we would, what we need to understand is that the impact of the policy, if you like, of the policy initiative is maybe at this stage similar to what Black and William have said about assessment for learning in that the success is only partial and we need to go much further down that track of changing the, the culture of what we do in schools to, to see the benefits and the, and the um, extent of, of DFA and even students themselves, as you've seen from the data, are telling us it needs research, it needs reflection, it needs to be thought about so that we can actually um, seek the true benefits of, of what it can offer. I think you will see from this presentation as well that there is an imperative to involve students in policy formation and review. This is coming um, apace uh, the, the field of assessment is probably one of the last bastions of education that sort of 
has maybe resisted the the um the role of students as equals and as equal stakeholders i've done quite a lot of work on this already um which shows a reluctance almost of assessment professionals or those who um, deal with assessment and assessment systems to sort of share ownership or knowledge of assessment with students. But in terms of policy experimentation and policy review, children's role in that is becoming more and more prevalent. And even within the European Commission, they are looking at children's rights. They have uh, frameworks around how you might involve children in policy development and policy formation and those higher order sort of higher order echelons of education curriculum design school improvement um, and assessment very much so should involve children they have a lot to say they have things to say that we should be listening to and they have an investment in how their assessment systems are set up so we would be calling as part of this research to um to ask for students uh, participation in any assessment reform the other big thing is really around capacity building that actually teachers need capacity building in the pedagogical aspects of formative and digital formative assessment. And students need to be capacity built with around the learning aspects of formative assessment and digital form formative assessment. But I hope what we have tried to illustrate here is that actually you need both. You need both in dialogue, students and teachers together talking um, in partnership to um, effectively create the best assessment um, that they can. So when we ask students, um, sorry, could we just go back to that slide? Thank you. So when we ask students about what would you like to tell adults about your experience of digital assessment, these are some of the things that they came up with. Um, and again, it's reflective in the data, but this is really about, well, if you wanted to tell your school leader or if you wanted to tell the policymaker what it is that you think needs to happen, then it's very clear there. There's benefits, there's negative aspects of it. Teachers need to know what it should be like. Um, you can't assume that all students are, are have familiarity with all the apps. Electronic tests are complicated. Don't start to um, don't start to sort of change the system, and without some sort of evaluation or reflection on that. And there's errors in applications, but actually we do like it, and the activities are fun, and it makes learning more effective. So we would like to um, to to sort of have more of it but to do it in a, in a really constructive way. So uh, in the next slide, we're going to just see what they thought about uh, in terms of the, the, um, the dialogue labs. And I think you can just see from some of those quotes that they liked the fact that they were being talked to and with. They liked the, the ways in which they could talk with their peers. They liked to hear what other children were saying and other students were saying. Um, and so that they could be putting ideas forward. People were listening. Somebody other than their maybe teacher was listening that could actually affect change. And I think that that's really important that you always have, if you're working with students in any sort of dialogue manner, that you are listening, that they're being heard and that action takes um action is taken because of that. <coughs> so I think we're going to move on to the, the next slide, which then will just indicate a little bit about what participants said about di the dialogue approach uh, in, in general. Thank you, Jeanette. And just to, to round off, also in relation to the dialogue lab approach, there was a, a general feeling that it was something that they felt was a very helpful approach. It brought together different stakeholders. They were able to learn from one another. They were able to hear the other perspectives. The importance of having students involved so they 
could hear the authentic voices of the So the emphasis in relation to the policy experimentation was really having an opportunity to hear from those who are directly involved in assessment, digital formative assessment, trying to use these tools, trying to implement that approach was an opportunity to hear from them what they were experiencing and what their perceptions were. And I think what we all found was the contribution of the students was particularly well received by those who were perhaps a little nervous at the start of the involvement of students with policymakers, then were really able to value and to feel the, the worthwhile contribution that the students made. So finally, in terms of this particular part of the webinar, again, an interactive question for you, thinking about how you might use this Dialogue Lab approach in your own context to involve students, but not only in assessment processes, but this is an approach that can be used in policy development, in thinking differently, perhaps about different topics within education in general. So again, your ideas, if you could put in at least one that can be shared with everybody else, I think you've got ha the hang of how you've got to do it. It's running along the bottom of the screen there and we'll be able to share with you some of the things that you're seeing. Thank you and I'll hand back to Alex. Thank you very much, Janet and, and Kay. This was a very, very interesting presentation looking at what was discussed at the Dialogue Labs and so, the discussions were so rich we're really full of full of uh, of, of interesting uh, data and viewpoints but also the process of the dialogue labs and how you really uh, bring people together and, and and make them dialogue even when they sometimes have different point of views so um, as as uh, Kay and, and Janet mentioned there is a, an interactive question here for you so I I left the question on, on the screen and I invite you to uh, go to www.menti.com and, and, and respond to the question using the code that you can see on the on the scrolling text. Um, maybe it's also now uh, an opportunity to look at the what you responded to um, uh, the other question that uh, Kay and Janet raised uh, uh, during during the, the, the presentation. Um, and I would just like to um, in, invite Kay and, and Janet to have a look at what is uh, here coming on the on the screen about uh, the the practical ways that uh, 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 you can work with students to enable greater student involvement in developing uh, digital formative assessment uh, policies in in schools. Um, so I, I'm just going to remove um, the third question, but you can still go. Uh, to menti.com and respond to it using the um, the code that you see at the bottom of your of your screen. Uh, you can see uh, or, or already some uh, responses there to the second question, um, and um, maybe I'm, I'm just going to bring uh, Jeanette and, and, and Kay on the on the stage just to see if you if you can um, comment on what you can see on the screen. The, the the responses by the participants to, to today's webinar. Um, quite a lot of, of suggestions. Yes, yeah, sorry. Thanks. No, no, thanks, Alex. I really like the one about, I saw their students um, cooperating to generate assessment tasks. I think that's a really um, exciting project or activity that, that could be, uh, that we could do more of. I think that would be really, uh, really interesting because I think Kay and I have both come up against people saying to us, you know, that um, students can be involved in their assessment, but they could never generate the task or they could never generate the uh, the assessments. And I, I actually think they can because we've worked with students to do that. I think it's about the capacity building with them to be to be able to do that. So I really like that as a as a as a comment. Yeah. I I would agree, and, and I think um, my experience in running these dialogue labs is that often some of the stakeholders are rather reticent about the involvement of students and wondering that if they can responsibly provide some um, input and some dialogue. However, I think what we've found is that 
actually at the end you can see that they really are impressed and the responsibility that the students do actually take to provide their feedback and to engage in interaction um, and the importance of, of realizing that not only can they offer a, a valuable contribution, but they give real insight into how assessment is experienced and actually what they're gaining from that, that process. So some of these ideas that we're seeing in there are, are excellent ideas and it, it is really um, so good to see that uh, you are able to show that you see the value of involving students and the importance of letting them feel that they are part of that learning process. And I think one of the things is also what we saw in our findings was the benefits that come from when the, the students feel they have some control in their own learning process and they have some control around that assessment. And that seems to come through that interaction, that social interaction through digital formative assessment. I, I also think there's some really good, good ideas there by getting in at the beginning of the year. And I think and I think that would be fantastic whole school planning with students and teachers about formative and summative assessments so that would link in some way to that whole school those whole school protocols that the students were talking about so actually even taken away from this starting a project that worked with students to sort of say okay if we're going to use more digital um, <clears throat> tools within the classroom what should some of the, the the protocol be? What what should we um, what should we put down as sort of ways of working together? Ways in which that we might be able to sort of be able to see our way through this year. I think that would be a fantastic um, project. And the students also said to us, "You need to involve um, younger students. So start with the the students at the beginning of the school." not only the ones at the top of the school, say the 14 year olds, start earlier and bring them because what's gonna happen afterwards is going to impact them. So they're very clear about their, their sort of their community, their peers, but actually, um, and in a way, sort of learning from them rather than us teaching them about what what we want them to do is actually for us to learn from them about what should be done. Yeah. Just to pick up on that point, which I can hear Jeanette saying, is that um, the students were expressing that in many cases they wished that their teachers would listen to them. And, and the point that they wanted to make was because they were experiencing the different digital tools and particularly when they were moving between different teachers and they could see the way that different teachers were trying to use digital tools, they were saying, if we were able to tell them, this is how we're experiencing them, these are the tools that we can see are working, these are the ones that we can see are not really helping us, they're not really making a, such a strong contribution to our learning as other ones, then we could give this feedback to our teachers, we could make a contribution not only to their own ability to learn within the classroom, but also they could make a contribution to these whole school profile protocols if they were asked. So they were really pleased to be at the dialogue labs, but they also felt that they could contribute more within their own schools if they were asked. So some of these ideas where you're thinking about involving the students as soon as possible and trying to find ways even if it's starting with the small groups, um, it's so important and also giving them the opportunity, as they've said themselves, just like we as adults need professional learning around these matters, the building of the capacity of the students to engage in dialogue is really an important part of that whole school profile as well. Many thanks, uh, Kay and, and Janet. What I propose is that um, while we we uh, let the audience still respond to the to the third question, we have a look at what is taking place uh, in the in the chat. 
between participants. Uh, there is some, some, some discussion. There are quite a number of points that are, that are being made. Um, I can see, for instance, quite a number of comments about uh, the issue of grading and what, how do you deal with students who keep on, 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 on wanting to be graded. Uh, for instance, there is uh, this, this very interesting comment uh, uh, from, from Violeta Stelmasic, uh, uh, who's saying that um, any sort of grading is said to be a bad effect on, 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 on their students. And that she often hears from, from, from her student, is it for a grade? And if not, they lose their, their will to work. Um, so how can, how can you motivate students? How can you make them understand that grading in itself is not, is, 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 is not an end in itself? Um, what kind of discourse can you, can, you, can you have? What kind of practices uh, can be used to, to, in a way, go beyond that, that grading uh, element? I think you can also get students to grade themselves. So I think you involve them in the process of actually of summative assessment. And again, you would you sort of I think some of the work that we've done is you you would work with them for them to understand um, uh, what what the content is, what the sort of the um, the exam is what the answer is and then start to get them to grade themselves now i know that doesn't answer the question specifically about well if it's not graded i don't want to do it um but i i think that you can often you can often i mean i'm there's lots of teachers on the call or, or on the platform today and i'm not going to tell teachers how to teach and how to assess but i think it's the sharing of the assessment so that nothing is hidden with students so even talking through why they feel like they don't want to do it if it's not going to contribute trying to understand their the the experience of, of that for them and then maybe talking through in a dialogue type manner that actually the better understanding of assessment and and how you might grade it yourself will enable you to um perhaps do better in those situations where you are forced, when you are faced um, with assessment tasks in examinations. Because in some ways, ass assessment tasks and examinations and are, are different things, but they come together very often um, to, to sort of evaluate students. So why don't we work with students more about what these exam things are. They're often seen as other or I'm graded and then I don't get any feedback on that. So it's it's trying to then close that loop with these tests that I'm graded for and that mean something. Um, and we, we've been working here in Ireland about trying to th think about how you might incorporate teacher assessment more at a system level so that it, teacher assessment isn't just something that happens in the classroom, it happens for a contribution to the grade. So that everything, um, not everything is assessed, but everything becomes as important as everything else so that one doesn't become more important than the other and drives practice more than the other. I, I think it's, yes. it's such an important point, Violetta, that you're making because this is something that still needs a lot of work to be done. Um, we saw in the student feedback that they were saying themselves that it's not an either or, it's not a question of moving to digital formative assessment. They were saying, yes, we want digital formative assessment, but we still want our grades. So they were seeing the necessity as, as a currency they, to, to move forward in, in their careers and the importance of the grade so I think what it really needs, and, and you've seen again in our results that, that the, the importance of that mind shift and the discussion of assessment and really what is the purpose of assessment and what will help you as a student most, getting a grade at the end of it and then not any feedback on how you're going to progress puts an end to the matter. Whereas if you're having formative assessment where you're building your own awareness 
of where you're going in your learning and the kinds of things you're good at, the kinds of things that you still need to work on, helps you to move forward. It isn't just giving you a grade. And I think, you know, Jeanette's point about involving the student, one of the things that I think is really helpful is to look at different examples of, of work and to be able to say to the students, here's different pieces of work. How would you analyze them to say, what is it about this one that you would grade it at such and such? What is it about this one that you would give this? So they can learn to be able to see and engage in that assessment process themselves. I think somehow we think that we as teachers should be doing the assessing. I think engaging them in learning about how to assess and what assessment is all about and the benefits when you understand the assessment process can make such a difference. This really echoes uh, some of the comments that are currently being exchanged on the on on, on the chat um, about. It. I mean, there are many things that are being discussed, uh, including peer assessment at the beginning, but also uh, really the need to um, to discuss what uh, uh, learning is and how and what assessing learning for le in order to learn is, um, which you know, also also uh, recall some of the points that were uh, answered in the in the second question, having that discussion at the beginning of the year. Um, and not only not only with the with the students, probably parents also need to be told not to just, you know, focus on the on, on the grades. So I, I really see in, in the chat the discussion going on between the participants. Uh, uh, that echoes what 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 you are saying. Um, I propose now that we have a quick look at the responses to the third question. Uh, and in the meantime, your the participants, you're most welcome to continue exchanging in the in the chat. Um, so let's have a look at at, at have. Let's take just a, a minute to read a little bit what there is there. If I might just reflect on on the the comment where, for some for some countries who are um, um, colleagues who are attending from countries on the platform who maybe don't even involve students much in in any sort of uh, reflective activity, never mind sort of dialogue. Um, <clears throat> it's I'm not saying that it's easy. The process isn't easy, and I think maybe. Uh, Nina and Nacho might give you a flavour of the sort of the the difficulties maybe that we we um, experience in setting up the student dialogue labs in in the countries. Not not everybody is willing to hand over to students some authority on what assessment is in this particular topic or what curriculum might be because it's often well what do they know? We're we're the adults. We're the ones who know. But if you read the literature around um, the student voice within education, it's really started very, very slowly and also uh, step by step in just showing, it's like showing by doing really, that if you even start within your own classroom to involve students, then they, that almost brings an expectation with it that when, when they go into other classrooms, they might expect to be asked about their opinions or their views. And I think that you can do it in smaller spaces. And then it's hopefully with um, the more we do research like this. So in a couple of weeks, I'm presenting to the European Commission about why would you involve students in curriculum design or assessment design? And it's actually then maybe through those um, avenues that other you know, ministries in your own countries can start to say, well, what, what are we doing about this? So it's like a two-pronged a two approach, if you like, that you're actually starting to say, um, um, at the ministerial level, 
which is what we're hoping comes out of the Assess for Learning project, that there have been colleagues in ministries who have now had experience of Student Dialogue Lab and we're, we're hoping, and they've told us that that's what they're going to do, is that they're going to involve students in, in dialogue. So for those, again, for those who maybe their, their situations or their, their uh, contexts aren't as uh, forward thinking, I think that's the value of research, because research is evidence that you can share with people and show, and show the the positive aspects of what can come out of it and so it's it is hard to convince i've in again in my own work i've been trying to convince examination boards so the people who are responsible for national assessments that they need to talk to students and it didn't always fall on um uh sort of listening ears so it is almost a game of attrition it is if you're if you believe in um and you can see the benefit of students as partners, then I think you you have to be brave and do it in those spaces where you can. And often teachers in their classrooms are, are the beginnings of those spaces where they can start to, to, to allow students to have their say and, and to, to start working with students as partners. If I can just add to that, um... I mentioned in, in the introduction that the Dialogue Lab approach had been trialed in a previous project, which was um, on, on Teach Up, uh, Teach Up, and it involved 10 countries across Europe. It didn't have students involved, but we were suggesting in policy experimentation and policy development, then there should be stakeholders, including teachers, including parents and so on and even at that stage for some of the countries it was a huge leap even to ask teachers into discussing policy never mind asking them to invite students and that was where the dialogue lab approach where it was very structured with focused questions and there was a facilitation of the dialogue to enable the breaking down of some of those hierarchical barriers where the sense was, well, the policymakers are away up here. And, and, you know, asking the teachers to be part of that was a huge gap that had to be crossed in order to bring these stakeholders together. And in this project, in many ways, again, the, the, it was a leap for some countries to be able to then involve students in that policy context and in that dialogue with so you know the educational consultants with the policy makers with researchers with teacher educators and so on and again it was the very structured approach where the sessions and it, it wasn't a leap into open dialogue it was actually being able to say well this is it's going to be structured like this. We'll have an introduction to a particular question that we're going to discuss, and then we're going to offer opinions on it in this very short period together as a group, a small group. And again, the number is really important so that it doesn't become too big that not everybody is involved in that school small group discussion. And then saying, well, what are we going to then offer in the plenary from our group and together the facilitator? help them to come up with those two or three main points and then they were feeding it back in plenary and then in the next dialogue lab they were hearing that their points had been heard and they were important in moving it forward and it created confidence to be able to engage in that dialogue and again Nina and Nacho in the next session will be able to explain to you how important that structured dialogue and the guidelines were in enabling the dialogue labs, both the country dialogue labs and the student dialogue labs to be effective and to be successful and for people to be involved. But it needs a, a careful step. It's not a straightforward process to go straight into inviting teachers or inviting students without setting it up carefully. Just before we move on to the next session, I would just like to pick up the point about it's difficult to do it with younger children. I know it may look difficult, but we've done it. It can be done. And, and in some ways it might just be using the techniques that you use 
in classroom with younger children to actually get them talking about assessment. So students of mine have maybe been looking at how, how do you involve uh, st younger students in policy development, and they might be using um, circle time, or they might be using activities that you might use in a primary and a younger primary classroom, but as research methods, so that you you um, you actually take some of the activities that young children are used to, and you talk to them um, in you talk to them in ways in which uh, you can capacity build with them. Again, as Kay was saying, it, it's not easy. It does take work, but I think the rewards are 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 vast. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kay and Janet. Thank you very much to all of you who contributed by responding to, to, to these interactive questions and, and to in, in the chat as well. Uh, please continue the, the, the discussion. I think you, uh, Kay and Janet, you made a, a, a good transition to hearing uh, what dialogue brings for the organization that organized the, the, the dialogue. Um, and I think it's a good moment now to um, ask our colleagues, um, Nacho and, and, and Nena, to come. But thank you again very much for, uh, for your presentation, Kay and, and Janet. Um, Nacho, can I ask you to uh, come to the floor, please? Yes. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Um, okay. Thank you, Alex. Um, um, hello, everyone. Uh, do you see the presentation? Yes. Excellent. Good. I was always saying uh, hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ignacio, and I work in the international department of the National Institution of uh, Educational Technologies and Teacher Training from the Ministry of Education in Spain. Okay, And yes, as part of, of the team of the Access and Learning Experimentation uh, Policy Team, uh, we hosted these uh, events, you know, these three country dialogue labs and two student dialogue labs. And there are, uh, you know, some relevant points uh, I want to share with you. But also, I want I want to you know highlight the, the excellent explanation that Kay and Jeanette um, did this presentation because they explain very in, with very detailed uh, what a, a country dialogue lab and a student dialogue lab is and uh, what kind of participants were involved and the you know the the important part of the of the social aspect in this in this kind of uh, online events so we hosted you know three these uh, country dialogue labs and, and two student dialogue labs and uh, we wanted to highlight these four aspects of these online events first of all it was the it was a great experience you know hosting these these events uh, as, a, as a country and, and uh, also, it was, uh, as Jeanette were saying, it was a very rewarding experience also. You get to talk with uh, experts and, and students. Um, also, Kay was saying that uh, you have to be very well prepared in these events uh, because you have to follow these strict guidelines, you know, uh, a very strict structure and uh, with uh, organizing the different group discussions and uh, you know I, I have to I have to thank them because uh, every very everything was very well um, very well prepared in advance so we as countries we we had you know um, we did I think uh, a great event and also I want to highlight the feedback you know you, know, you get because this is uh, very relevant for the project and also to develop more knowledge in this topic in the digital formative assessment. So um, we record the sessions and also we take notes of the of everything. So uh, um, we send them, you know, to 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 the to the final final notes and. Um, I want to share with you some benefits 
um, first of all, you know, the empathy and assertiveness, you know, from the direct interaction between experts and students. Uh, some will know the points of view of the others with different ideas that perhaps from their own perspective are not perceptible. So you share, you know, these, these ideas amongst uh, other uh, people. Also, I want to also another benefit you will see, you know, about getting knowledge of uh, formative assessments and digital formative assessment. Uh, so experts could provide a unique and valuable perspective on the digital formative assessment. Also, another benefit for the participants will be that you gained debate skills. All participants develop communication, uh, negotiation, critical thinking, and um, another benefit will be networking. Uh, formative meetings offer, you know, the opportunity to establish valuable professional and educational connections and relationships. Um, another part will be motivation. I think uh, students could be motivated, you know, by hearing firsthand about experience and success of experts in their field and uh, by having the opportunity, you know, to be part of, uh, of the meeting at the same level as the, as the expert. Um, the next one will be learning by doing. Students could learn by doing and apply what they have learned uh, to their future work. And the final benefit uh, we highlighted is dissemination because formative meetings could be a platform, you know, to share knowledge and improve this understanding that you have in, in a certain topic. In this matter is the digital formative assessment. And later on, you you could share this information and also you could disseminate it to others. Uh, we had, of course, some challenges organizing these events. The first, uh, for the first one, it will be recruiting because uh, sometimes it was tough to recruit uh, experts. You know, it was tough because you have to be available on the day and the time that uh, was scheduled. And not a lot of people, you know, could uh, uh, attend these meetings in the morning. So it was sometimes tough to, to fit everything. Another challenge that we had uh, as an organizer, it was uh, to organize, organize the discussion groups, you know, uh, because um, we have to practice with the software that we didn't know and also organizing, you know, um, even groups and also the rotations because uh, in if it was uh, an on-site uh, like we did in another projects like on-site events this is this could be uh, you, you could do this part more easily because uh, but uh, online for us it was a bit more difficult and also built a sense of a community on this topic you know sending information to the people on a regular basis and recruiting to the same uh, recruiting the same people to the you know to the to the different events to the country dialogue labs and student dialogue labs. Um, I want to share some relevant quotes, like uh, an expert say in general, independently of the subject, teachers should give students less tasks and projects to students, focusing less on the final mark and more on the feedback. Another quote of an expert, educational administrations must support the proposal and solutions of problems, providing training and support for innovation and research. And a final quote of a student, we would like to have clear explanations about how to use the different tools. If teachers agreed on some general points, we could learn better. So these are some quotes that we, we get from the, from the last CDL and SDL. Um, our last point is future, you know, with, because we, we built a strong community on digital formative assessment and we want to continue, we would like to continue to have these people, uh, involved in some activities about this topic. So we are planning to, uh, these students and these experts, uh, uh participate in another digital formative assessment as activities as a country level 
and also we will consider their participation in another, in an other future projects you know so we recommend as a final part to get into the uh, assets and learning web page and our also our web page from the Ministry of Education in TEF that uh, you could see that uh, there are the links uh, and you can you get uh, you can download uh, some resources about digital formative assessment and also in a near future the the results of this policy experimentation and uh, for us that's it <laughs> thank you very much and if you have any question just uh, launch it <laughs> thank you very much Nacho and it's it's really pleasing to see that the uh, the community which you have uh, created through the, the dialogue labs uh, uh, will continue hopefully with yes. the, the additional involvement of the students in um, in that new activity on digital formative mm -hmm. assessment at country level um, and hopefully adopting the same mechanism of uh, 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 listening to uh, to students to what they what, what they have to say in your other projects at the at the ministry that's that's really great thank you very much nacho for uh for sharing your your thoughts thank you um i'd like to ask nena to also come uh from uh from greece hello nena how um how did the dialogue lab process uh, go in greece and what what community was created there all right um uh, good good evening, everyone, from the city of Athens, Greece. Um, I'm Lena Karagiani from Computer Technology Institute, CTI in short, uh, which is an organization supervised by the Greek Ministry of Education with a national institutional role regarding the use of ICT in education and the development of teachers' digital skills. Um, CTI is one of the Assessed Learning Project partners and has coordinated the implementation of the field trials with 72 participating schools in Greece, as well as the conduct of three country dialogue labs and two student labs. Now, um, I was asked by my colleagues to briefly comment in a five minute time how the dialogue labs can contribute to the development of communities of stakeholders. So, Alex, I will focus on that as a originally inquired. Uh, what my colleague Nacho mentioned before also apply in our case too, organizing and conducting the dialogue labs was a very challenging and demanding, but also very rich and uh, rewarding experience. Um, I should say that in our case, the labs community of stakeholders was in fact based on a core community, which was previously formed in the framework of other dialogue labs organized for a preceding policy experimentation project also coordinated by a European school net, uh, entitled Teach Up, Teachers Upskilling. This community that was originally created via the dialogue process in the Teach Up project uh, was augmented within the Assess at Learning Dialogue Labs process, uh, where new members were warmly welcomed to express and contribute their views on equal ground and on a new topic, that of the digital formative assessment. Uh, so from the Greek experience, we have tangible evidence that the dialogue labs as a process and as a practice can indeed help to build, sustain and expand communities of stakeholders on topics. Uh, also, that as a methodology it is flexible and transferable to different contexts and different topics thus it can be applied to a wide range of educational matters 
Now, in my opinion, key characteristics of the dialogue lag process with respect to the creation and reinforcement of the sense of the community are that um, this process provides a specific framework and a well-structured and clearly defined, focused and commonly agreed among all stakeholders a process uh, to bring different voices together on equal and fair terms as Keynes and it elaborated earlier. They facilitate the essential interaction of the stakeholders um, and the equally valued voicing of the different aspects and opinions, and thus they enable a more global approach to the matters in, discuss in discussion. Another important characteristic is that the structure of the dialogue lab allows to capture the different points of view in a more efficient and functional way, so that they are sustainable and usable on a policy level, uh, to, to be taken into account for new policies development. These points were also underlined by the feedback we received from our lab's participants both adults and students who said that it was a positive and beneficial experience, that the structured format of exchanging views and the successful dialogue uh, created the feeling of a community. And also uh, they said that it was a particularly productive discussion process for them and that they found it beneficial to have acquired the dialogue labs culture. Uh, it is worth mentioning also that the students who participated in the Greek labs also said that it was a very positive experience for them, that they felt that they acted as equal stakeholders and that their voices were really heard. So from Greece, there is evidence that the community can be built via the dialogue labs process. However, in order for this community to be sustained, it is important that it receives appropriate support and encouragement, for instance, by sustaining some kind of regular contact between the members of the community and by involving them further in other European and national initiatives on educational matters. Related ideas come from the Greek lab participants are to organize intra-school dialogue labs on national level and international dialogue labs on a European level. That's the input from Grace. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lena. Very interesting and really nice suggestions also from uh, from the students with these intra intra schools uh, or inter schools uh, dialogue labs and uh, and with indeed uh, if if it could be organised a larger uh, dialogue lab at at, at European level. Um, thank you very much to all the all the speakers. We're now about to close the. Uh, the webinar. It's been a very, very, very informative and very interesting uh, presentation and discussion um, by, uh, by by Kay and, and Jeanette. Um, and the, very interesting also to listen to the, the, the perspectives, the viewpoints of uh, the country partners, the Ministry of Education and Vocational Training in Spain and uh, the, the CTI in, in, in Greece. Um, I think you could really see uh, what the dialogue lab process um, brings in terms of, of of the possibility to share different viewpoints and to and to be heard. I think this is really interesting for for students. I was actually listening and reflecting to myself that it would have been great when I was a pupil to have such a mechanism to be able to just to say what I. Um, what I feel about the way my learning is assessed. So again, thank you very much. Um, what I want to say is that um, we have a report on uh, the social impact of digital formative assessment 
uh, uh, on students, which uh, we will publish at the end uh, of February. So please stay tuned. In the meantime, uh, you can come to the uh, Assess at Learning website, uh, download the uh, report from the field trials, also have a look at uh, a nice animated video that explains the results from the field trials. And there will be, as I mentioned, the report on the social impact of digital formative assessment on students at the end of February. I also just uh, wanted to um, uh, recall that we have an additional webinar on Friday um, at 3 p.m. Um, uh, Central uh, European time. Uh, so this Friday and not Wednesday, sorry, as you as you saw on the screen, it's Friday 3 p.m. Central European time. And there we will have the opportunity to dig deep into the toolkit on digital formative assessment, which we developed for the, ex the, the experimentation. And we'll be able to look at the different tools and processes that different education actors can use to implement digital formative assessment in school. Thank you very much again for your participation. We will be sharing the recording and the slides uh, with you. I also invite you to um, respond to a short survey about how the webinar went. And on that note, I thank you again very much for your participation and look forward very much to seeing you on Friday. Thank you and goodbye.